Uh, my name is Mahendra Rao, and I'm going to be just the moderator in the session, and I may add a few words regarding government policy. This session, for those of you who were fortunate enough to have been there in the morning session when Dita presented on somatic cell nuclear transfer, is a follow-on on that session. And what we're going to do is have two main speakers, and they'll tell you a little bit more about the science of somatic cell nuclear transfer and in terms of its application, and then you'll hear from Aaron on the ethics and issues related to that. We'll have two short follow-up presentations without slides from Steve Chang and myself, where we'll tell you a little bit about the government and commercial applications of SCNT, but hopefully that will give us plenty of time for questions, and we hope that this will be a very interactive session because we think it's a cutting-edge topic with a lot of issues and a lot of things that need to be debated or discussed as a society on how one best moves forward. So without further ado, Dita. Thank you, Mahendra. So this is a little bit of my personal journey, how they, how, you know, guidelines, ethical and ethics and laws affected nuclear transfer research. And also my own professional path from uh, Harvard University to the New York Stem Cell Foundation Laboratory. So when I um, first joined, you know, Harvard University, then there were, you know, it wasn't so clear how human somatic cell nuclear transfer could and should be done. This was all extremely controversial for various reasons, and not everybody agreed that this is a worthwhile goal, even though, you know, scientifically, it was clear that the use of autologous stem cells could have huge medical implications. And until today, it is the case that many countries prohibit the use or donation of human oocytes. Some prohibit it for reproduction, some prohibit it for research. I need to add that in the United States, it's quite common to use donated human oocytes for reproduction. But despite that, uh, the National Academy of Science in 2005 said, um, well, well, at that time it was actually quite um, an advanced move because it was so controversial, this was very progressive. But they said, well, if we use oocytes for research, there should be no money involved. So now, when it comes to using oocytes for reproduction or do donating oocytes to another couple who has trouble conceiving using their own eggs, there is very often some compensation involved, financial compensation, in the order between five and perhaps $10,000. And so, when we wanted to start that type of nuclear transfer research on human eggs in the state of Massachusetts, these were the guidelines that applied to our research by the National Academy of Science. And so we said, we're going to comply with those guidelines. Because what are guidelines good for if you don't comply, comply with them? We had to comply with them and we wanted to comply with them. Also, the state of Massachusetts adopted those guidelines as a law. So, even though it is legal to donate, to compensate women for oocyte donation for reproduction, it's not for stem cell research. And there is, that, of course, generates a discrepancy. Now, what, what is the consequences of that? Well, so Harvard University with Kevin Egan, me as a postdoc, and Douglas Melton um, very, puts some very significant weight into getting this effort started. Advertisement campaigns, and indeed, many women were interested in donating oocytes. They called, um, as you can see here, 239 potential donors. But only one of them ultimately stepped forward um, and donated oocytes. And you, the reasons why many of them did not is they expressed concerns about money and compensation, the time commitment, which is essentially the same, and because oocyte donation for research involves some medications and injections, that's also a concern. This is certainly not one that should be uh, discounted. But we can't do anything about that. This is a very valid concern, but we can certainly do something about these two, the money and compensation and the time commitment. So if a woman has a choice between donating oocytes for reproduction and getting compensated, or donating oocytes for um, research, and getting just the cap fares reimbursed, what is she going to choose? Um, and so in New York, 
uh, Mark Sauer from uh, CWRC, he made a survey among all site donors who donate, have decided to donate all sites for reproduction. So this is among a cohort of women who had already decided they wanted to donate all sites. So they were fine with the injections and medications. And so what they were asked is whether they, if they were asked to donate all sites for research instead of for reproduction, whether they would ask for money or not. And it's an interesting question. And so you can see here that they were also given an amount of how much they would uh, want to get to be, to, in order to give their all sites for research. And most of them chose this number, it's $8,000. And so this is also the number that women get in New York generally as a compensation for reproductive egg donation. I need to add is that this amount, this um, $8,000 that's before taxes, so what the woman really gets is perhaps in the order of six, between six and $7,000. So most women said they would want that type of amount, some would do it for less, and very few would said they would do it for free, although the joke is that these women were probably not from New York. <laughs> so, so it was at that time when it became clear that you couldn't get all sides for free. That was our experience at Harvard University. And that the American Society for Reproductive Medicine stepped forward and drafted new guidelines. And what they said, in my eyes, that makes a lot of sense. If there is a compensation, then it should not vary according to the planned use of the oocytes or the number or the quality of oocytes received. So whether you use those oocytes for reproduction or use them for stem cell research, the, woman, the woman's effort is the same. So they should be compensated the same. And then the International Society for Stem Cell Research made a very cautious statement and said, obviously, acknowledged that obviously there is some form of compensation required to get that research going, but it should not um, involve an undue indu inducement in that women would discount the potential risk associated with the hormones, the injections, or the oocyte retrieval itself. You, oocyte retrieval is, of course, a, a, a surgical procedure. It's um, minor, it lasts perhaps 20 minutes, but and there's a very good safety record, but still that one has to consider what the potential risks could be. So the way also what, what happened then is based on that knowledge, the New York State made an ethical review, an ethical evaluation. And it came down on the side of compensation of all site donors. And based on this, the New York stem, State Stem Cell Program decided they could fund compensation for research or site donation. And to this day, this is the only funding agency with taxpayers' dollars funded by a state that says that this can be done this way. It's a very remarkable um, step, very progressive, um, that they, they are doing that. And that's what allowed this remarkable research that I showed you this morning. So I think this is a wonderful situation that we have in New York. And I, I wish and I'm hoping that other states would, would follow a similar example. It's not currently the case in California that also has a very large stem cell program. They cannot use some funds for this type of experiments. And, and that's why most, uh, the, we are probably still a center of that type of research in the US. Um, so what we do and the way we address those followed those guidelines, in particular the one of the ISSCR, that there should be no undue inducement, is we don't ask women on the street whether they want to do, donate oocytes. We do, that, we do that in a very different way. So we ask women who have already decided to participate in an egg donor program, who have been screened extensively, who've had a psychological and other types of exams, and who have decided and have made an informed decision that they wanted to donate oocytes for the reproductive program. And once they have passed all that screening, they are presented with the option to donate for research instead. And so far there has been no woman who would say, no, because of research I'm not going to donate. So they are, they are 
welcoming that uh, opportunity. <clears throat> So this has provided us with a very unique source of oocytes for, for research. It's the first of its kind of that program in the United States, and it's a led, program led by Dr. Mark Sauer. And the, the, the research on those eyes, oocytes is done by New York, in the New York Stem Cell Foundation Laboratory in Upper Manhattan, uh, so, which is mostly funded through private philanthropy. And um, in the beginning, uh, the federal government does not fund that type of research. Uh, that's still the case, even though the, the Obama administration has moved to make increase access to human embryonic stem cells and embryonic stem cell research. This is not a type of research they're able to fund. But it is important they're able to fund iPS cell research and many other exciting stem cell studies. But I, I believe I, I made a point this morning that we also need those nuclear transfer cells to provide a point of reference for what we are generating with those iPS methods. So this is a very important research and I, I think should deserve some recognition from the government as well. Um, a similar program was more recently modeled after ours at the Oregon Health and Science Universities. And another egg donation program is in the United Kingdom in Newcastle where they have so far mostly done egg sharing. So what that does is half, up to half of the oil sites um, retrieved during IVF treatment are donated for research in exchange for a reduction in the fees of the IVF treatment. But I think more recently they have also been moving to a program that compensates all site donors for all donations specifically for research without any involvement in, in the reproduction. And so this is where we stand today. We, we can, it's still very unique research. It's possible. It has been a long and hard fight to get this going, but, but we, we can do it, and, and this is good. But there is, of course, now the question is, how do we translate this into therapies? And there's still a lot of challenges um, today when, when people want to study the cells we generate if we can sell them elsewhere. So there's, there's still a lot of regulatory questions surrounding that. And perhaps now um, I give the word back to Mahendra. Well, thank you. It's actually a real pleasure to, uh, to follow Dieter in this, this talk. I'm going to sort of build on a lot of the things he has said um, and talk some about the, the ethics and policy issues associated with somatic cell nuclear transfer and then how that might affect the future of this field. First, as a quick introduction, I'm in the School of Public Policy at, at Georgia Tech. And as a disclosure of sorts, I guess I am on the Stem Cell Research Oversight Committee at the New York Stem Cell Foundation, which provides oversight for, for Dieter's work. Although, I don't think I was actually involved in the meeting where, where your work was, was approved, so maybe there's, there's no conflict, but maybe that will share some of my, uh, my views on, on this. Um, in any case, i uh, move quickly through this. Clearly, a lot of important and exciting progress in this field over the last year and a half or so. Just a few of the, the papers, and if any of you saw Dieter's keynote this morning, you saw a lot of the, the rapidly advancing science in this area. Um, what I want to think about briefly today is how did ethical debates, and there are lots of ethical debates in this field, and the policy of environment that resulted from these ethical debates affect this work. We've already heard from Dieter that it was sort of a long and uneven and, and bumpy journey to get to, to where we are today. And perhaps more importantly, how do these debates and the, the policy environment, how, how are they likely to affect the, the future of work in this field? Um, so I'm going to step back to just sort of a broad overview of some of the ethical concerns that have been raised in this area. Um, so when you start talking about somatic and cell nuclear transfer, you are talking about the creation of, of human embryos for research purposes. So this raises concerns for a non-trivial subset of the, the population, certainly not everybody. Um, varies around the world within the United States in all sorts of different ways. But again, of course, both creation and destruction of, of embryos. In the world of ethics, we typically refer to this as a, a moral status question, and issues come down to really what you think about the, the moral worth of an embryo, how it compares to those of us sitting in these rooms, and, and whether it is appropriate or not to conduct research on it. Um, there are entire meetings, entire books on this topic. I'm not going to delve more into it today, just to, to say it's always there in the, in the background. But it's not unique 
to somatic cell nuclear transfer research in any way it applies to human embryonic stem cell research much more broadly. Um, the last two, though, are sort of somatic cell nuclear transfer related concerns that have been raised repeatedly since the late 90s when the, the cloning of Dolly and the isolation of human embryonic stem cells sort of brought this idea of human therapeutic cloning or somatic cell nuclear transfer for research purposes to the, to the forefront. And so the idea that somatic cell nuclear transfer could be used not just for research, for creating patient matched stem cell lines, for address, addressing various infertility related issues, for basic research, there is this certainly possibility of linking somatic cell nuclear transfer to reproduction. And we, of course, heard Bernie talk earlier. This is sort of how he got in the field in the first place. Um, there's good reason not to want to do this, and I don't think there's many, if any, legitimate scientists that are out there saying we should be using somatic cell nuclear transfer for reproductive purposes, but it is unfortunately and inevitably true that the better scientists get at making embryos through somatic cell nuclear transfer, the more it is enabling to people who are on the various fringes of the scientific community to think about using this technique. And so that linkage does pose real challenges. Um, Paul Knopfler, who many of you know as a, a blogger in this area, blogged fairly recently about a fertility clinic that was advertising on its website the ability to use somatic cell nuclear transfer to help treat infertility. And this is really a follow-on to some of the work that, that Chukrat did at Oregon Health Sciences, um, saying, oh, look, this work is being advanced. We can use this for infertility. And that's certainly not what Chukrat would tell you. It's certainly not what Dieter would tell you. Indeed, Dieter's, one of Dieter's points this morning was, look, there are too many different mutations and things for this really to be appropriate for reproduction. But that, that is out there nonetheless. Um, talking about sort of the fringes of the scientific community. This was a paper published a number of years ago in the Archives of Andrology, Possible Therapy of Male Infertility by Reproductive Cloning, reporting on the creation of both human embryos through somatic cell nuclear transfer and human cow hybrid embryos through somatic cell nuclear transfer and the attempted transfer of one of the human embryos to a, a woman's uterus. It was not successful, but just to say there are people out there on the fringes who are, are willing to consider that, and that means this doesn't go away. Um, more practically, though, and I think this is really what Dieter was talking about, the ethics sort of and policy concern that has really been a, a huge hindrance to the development of this field has been the, the requirement for, for human eggs. There's no good, easy, cheap, um, completely safe approach to acquire human eggs for research purposes or for, for reproduction. Um, but the need for large numbers of eggs has been a, a real hindrance. And I mean, you can see one of the things that really came through in the work in this field over the last couple of years is that it required a large number of eggs to systematically experiment to figure out what were the conditions you needed to make somatic cell nuclear transfer work. And so at states like New York, funding sources like the New York Stem Cell Foundation have really allowed this to advance, but it does suggest that you need access to a, not just a handful of eggs, but, but reasonably large numbers to, to make this work. And so there have been persistent ethical concerns about acquiring eggs both for reproduction and even more so for, for research. Um, I don't need to dwell on this. We've already heard this today. But very clearly, the policy environment over the last 15 years has affected the development of, of this field. Um, due to these ethical concerns, due to various debates in the area, there have been jurisdictions that have made somatic cell nuclear transfer research completely illegal. So it's been banned within different countries and certainly different states within the United States. There are rules, a wide variety of complicated rules on who and how this research can be funded. There are rules on and restrictions on how you can acquire eggs, who you can acquire them from, and importantly on whether or not you can compensate women to uh, provide or to donate eggs for, for research purposes. This is the, the paper I think Dieter took that chart from earlier reporting the, the difficulty acquiring eggs. Um, and the, the Harvard experiment, the Harvard effort to try to require to acquire eggs altruistically. Um, and what I really want to just talk about for the next few minutes is given this past, it's clear that policy has mattered. What does that mean for the, the future of this field? And just sort of tee up three possible things for us to, to think about in discussion. What does the policy environment mean for scientists who want to replicate and refine the, the derivation procedure? So want to create somatic cell nuclear transfer um, derived based human embryonic stem cell lines. So that's one question. What about scientists who don't want to create their own lines but would like to study existing lines? Um, 
Perhaps Dieter has made an interesting line in New York and someone in California or Massachusetts or Texas or Georgia would like to have that line shipped to them and, and study. How easy is that or how hard is that? And then finally, as you think further down the road, are there bar specific barriers to translating and, and commercializing somatic sound nuclear transfer based technologies? And I'm not going to say much there. I'm going to let Stephen talk a little bit more about that, but I'll, I'll hint at some of the difficulties. Um, so just a, a word on each of these. Can scientists replicate this? Well, indeed, they really can. We've seen in the year and a half since Shukrat's work that two other groups at least have produced human embryonic stem cell lines through somatic sound nuclear transfer. So it can be done, but I, I think Dieter would agree it's probably not easy. Um, so you need access to human eggs, which is very limited. You need access to non-federal funding sources in the United States, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. You may need access to, to separate facilities. So one of the unique things about New York Stem Cell Foundation is they have this private laboratory in Upper Manhattan that doesn't take federal funding and avoids these issues of commingling your federal funds with non-federally eligible work. But that's a, not an easy bar to clear. Many scientists who might be interested in this field don't have access to that kind of funding or a facility. Um, so perhaps the, the more important question, it might be OK if only a subset of scientists can derive these lines, but can others study them? Um, and again, it, it can be done, but it is harder than, than you would think. Um, and what actually surprised me as I looked into this is that it's actually much harder to study lines derived through somatic cell nuclear transfer than other existing human embryonic stem cell lines. Um, and importantly, and, and perhaps surprisingly, that's the case even in environments that are trying very hard to be supportive of stem cell research. So places like California and Massachusetts, for instance, hubs of stem cell research within the United States that have committed funding or at least political effort to supporting this have rules on their books that make it difficult, for instance, for Dieter to send his, his cells there and allow others to, to study them. Um, and I think that's worth noting because that actually is potentially a real hindrance on, on the development of, of this field. Um, a couple of minor points. So the NIH stem cell registry, NIH funding, of course, a, a huge and important source for biomedical research in the United States. It's very explicit. Somatic cell nuclear transfer-based embryonic stem cell lines are not allowed on the registry. And the implications are clear. You cannot use NIH funds to study these lines. And indeed, depending on your institutional legal offices, you may not be able to study these cells in buildings and facilities that have received NIH funds. This is an institution-by-institution decision. Places that are more risk-averse have been very hesitant to risk their broader federal funding portfolio by commingling eligible research and ineligible research. No one's really been ever got into trouble about this, but there's a lot of universities that are extremely risk averse. And so this has been an, an issue. Um, this is the guideline. It's an explicit political choice. Um, and I do want to make that point. The NIH decision to exclude somatic cell nuclear transfer was an active choice. NIH chose to do this. They're not constrained in this particular case by the Dickey Wicker Amendment. A lot of stem cell policy in the United States is constrained by this amendment that many of you, I'm sure, are aware of. But NIH could quite clearly choose to fund research on existing human embryonic stem cell lines derived through somatic cell nuclear transfer under its long-standing interpretation of, of Dickey Wicker. Indeed, the interpretation of Dickey Wicker that was rather painfully affirmed in the courts over the last few years, this would justify this funding on, for instance, Dieter's lines. Um, but in 2009, NIH chose not to make these lines eligible. We don't know the backstory on that, if it's an ethics choice, if it's a politics choice. There have been some public statements. The important point is NIH chose to do this. They could choose to change this if they wanted by executive action. This doesn't need to go through, through Congress. We also have the NAS guidelines in the US, Dieter, and used around the world. Indeed, Dieter talked about these, so I won't say much about them, except that they are very clear that egg donors must be altruistic only, no compensation. This is both for derivation, but also for use of existing lines. So if you're in a jurisdiction that follows NAS guidelines, you cannot use the cell lines produced in any of those three papers I showed you, because they, the, the donors were all paid in those cases. And so to be app approved under the NAS guidelines, you need to be able to document the provenance of those lines and include compliance with the derivation rules. Um, you know, in principle, the NAS guidelines are a living document. They could be updated but the committee doesn't exist right now, so it seems unlikely to be updating them anytime soon. Um, 
there are a lot of places that adhere to these guidelines, and so if you strictly adhere, that's a, a real challenge for this area going forward. Um, one of the interesting things about the, the US world of stem cell science is that we have a bunch of states that have gotten involved. So we've heard a lot about CIRM. There was a talk on CIRM 2.0 a little while ago. Um, the key point, these are all states that have tried hard to support stem cell research, that use their taxpayer dollars to support stem cell research. And even there, there are a lot of restrictions on using these cell lines, the cell lines Dieter and Shukrat and others have created. Um, so New York is the clear exception. Here you can both derive and use lines with both paid and altruistic egg donors. And, and Dieter talked about that ethics ruling and, and guidelines there. But in the other three states, Maryland, Connecticut, and California, it's really not the case. Um, certainly if the donor is unpaid, in Connecticut and California you can do this research, but if the donor's been paid, there are restrictions that look like they would, would probably block it. There's a little bit of a gray area on the use of existing cell lines because none of this was really anticipated at the time these regulations were created, but the best interpretation that, that I have seen or I can make based on the rules is that you probably couldn't do this right now. I leave Maryland in gray because that was unclear. I did talk to Dan Ginsell from the Maryland Stem Cell Research Fund last night, and he was pretty confident that these should be dark nose as, as well, suggesting that states that are supporting this research really, they're still putting up a lot of barriers to this particular line of stem cell research. Um, and so I'm, I really mainly want to leave it there just to say the third step, the commercialization, can this be done? Um, it, it could be, but there are a series of complex scientific, ethical, and economic barriers to getting there. I mean, as we've seen at this meeting and in other meetings, commercializing any cell therapy is hard. Um, commercializing a cell therapy that requires a source of human eggs and raises some of these issues is going to be that much harder. Um, I would separate the use of nuclear transfer and relay techniques for infertility, not using, not cloning for reproductive purposes, but some of the mitochondrial transfer and replacement techniques that Dieter was talking about, they might have a slightly better path forward given the history of innovation in the world of assisted reproduction and the reticence of the FDA to get quite as involved there as the autologous somatic cell nuclear transfer-based cell therapy approach. That, I think, is going to be a very difficult path to follow. Although, if there's a clear enough increase in efficacy, Pharmaceuticals and biotechs are, can be pretty creative in getting these things through, but without a really dramatic increase in effectiveness and efficacy, it's, it's hard to see an easy route forward there. So I will leave it there and, and turn it over to Stephen to, to continue the discussion and to a, a broader, look forward to questions later. So, my, my name is Mahindra Rao, and I have to make a confession first before I tell you what I'm going to talk about. So I don't work on SCNT. I have never derived an SCNT line. And my only association with embryos came with making ESL lines from fertilized embryos and working uh, with uh, colleagues of mine in the IVF clinic. But I had the same personal experience with government regulations, and which is why I'm perhaps chairing this session, was I was faced with government regulations which said that I could not work with some of the ES lines under government regulations that time because I worked in the government. And as a result, you heard about that from Aaron, about having facilities, et cetera, and that if you worked in a government facility, you couldn't uh, work on ES cell lines at that stage. The rules have changed now, and now we can work with ES lines. But it tells you, or it reminds me of the power of the government and how regulations can change the direction of science. And so what I'm going to try and do is tell you a little bit about how the government has influenced this field of research and what are the current things or issues that might come down the pike. So I'll be pretty brief uh, because some of the things have been covered by the folks before me. So I want to remind people of a couple of things. The government does many things, right? The three major ways it can affect science, uh, it provides policy. So that's a really important thing to keep in mind. And you've heard a little bit about policy and issues that go with it. A second way the government influences things is because it passes regulations. And particularly in the medical field, it's the FDA which passes regulations on what can be used or what, what is practice of medicine versus what is not practice of medicine. And then there is the NIH and funding, and funding for research that uh, occurs. So all of these three are important government functions, and all of them affect the way we do science. 
So I'm going to highlight a couple of things, um, each of these things, in terms of what can happen and cannot happen in being able to do this. So I'll start with funding because that's the most straightforward thing. And you heard right now, it's a blanket rule. If a line has been derived under these regulations, or it's from SCNT, or it's been derived by cloning, then it is not eligible to be on the NIH registry. If it's not on the NIH registry, and you can't document it's on the registry, then you can't write a grant for that particular line that can be used for funding. And it doesn't matter uh, if it was not put on the registry by policy, or it was because because there are no defined criteria on how it's going to be put on the registry that are published, which you can say that that's what it would work. And there's no timeline for being able to say de facto, like we have for other regulations where we say, if you don't give us a written objection to why it shouldn't be on that registry, it will de facto be on the registry. It's the other way around. Till we tell you yes, and we don't tell you how long it will take us to tell you yes, it will not be on the registry. And during that time, it's not eligible for funding. It's not even eligible as pending you know, a decision which is not true for other regulations. So that's a really important piece to keep in mind. And the criteria for deciding whether the line should be on the registry or not, other than consent, is not clear, right? So there are very clear rules on how consent was obtained for uh, lines or on the basis of which it can be on the registry. And there's a time window. Was it derived before that particular time or not derived before that particular time, depending on the country that needed to be done? So we have a huge problem with that. The second thing has been policy, and I'm going to go through policy a little bit uh, in more detail than what you heard, because Dita and so on told you about what are the current issues and time issues and cost issues that have been there with embryos, but there are a couple of additional issues as well. So what happened with, I want to walk you through about how eggs are used for IVF, okay? So normally you have a donor, and it's for personal reasons that you often want to have a child and you can't have a child, and you go to an IVF clinic. In an IVF clinic, uh, your body has to be prepared so that you can uh, ovulate an appropriate time, and you normally collect eggs. In general, the number of eggs you collect is larger than the number that you'll implant, because we don't have control over being able to do it, though there's new technology on being able to only uh, ovulate or do natural cycle uh, collections, etc. But those are different technologies. But in general, you will have maybe in any collection 10 or 12 sort of uh, uh, eggs that you'd collect. You would look at those eggs and then you would fertilize them in a dish and then you would look at them maturing to a certain stage and then you would implant them. And because the whole process is not very efficient, you would take out of these 8, 10, 12 eggs that you'd collected, uh, maybe implant 3 or 4. That used to be the routine till recently. Then the rules changed and now people are trying to do less. But that's the reason why you have a large number of twins now uh, because one in uh, 10 births is now an IVF birth, okay? And you implanted more than uh, a couple because you wanted to reduce the risk and the expense of going through multiple cycles to do it. So now you always had an excess of eggs and you had an excess of embryos and you generally stored them for future use and there was a cost associated with that storage. So earlier when the regulations were pretty straightforward, you could say there are extra eggs, they are fresh eggs, they were done at the time of donation, we can collect those eggs and use them. However, consent rules said that you can't ask for a donation at the time when you're going through an IVF procedure. So you could not use those eggs, so they had to be frozen. So the whole technology had to be done to make sure that the quality of the eggs was good enough so that you could use it. Eggs can't be stored easily, right? So then you had to go to the blastocyst to be able to see whether that could be used, and then there were rules against using a fertilized egg. So that became a problem in being able to do that. And so rules and how they're interpreted, or policy and how it's implemented, caused a big change in what were the choices you were going to make on the science side and what you were able to do or not do. And then you had this problem with compensation. Okay. Now it became pretty interesting as how the rules expand, right? That's always government creep, right? So science and researchers figure out a way to use unfertilized eggs because you could activate them so that they would think that they were fertilized and you could move that forward. And that was how certain pathogenetic lines were made. And initially there had been an assumption by scientists that parthenogenesis will not give us viable ES lines. But it turned out not to be true and you can get both male pathogenetic lines, there's a complicated way to do that, and you can get female pathogenetic lines. And both of those things have now been possible and those lines were made. 
But as policy, as you heard, it was decided that parthenogenetic lines, even though they didn't involve a fertilized embryo and it, even though they didn't involve destruction of a blastocyst, will be regulated under the same policy guidelines and ethical guidelines that we have, and therefore they won't be useful. So there's a company, and maybe Steve will talk about that, which actually made several parthenogenetic lines for com use as an alternative to having destruction of embryos. And unfortunately, they've never been able to register their lines on the government registry. Okay. So that's an important thing to keep in mind about policy. The second piece is on regulation. And here, there's a plus and a minus, and I'm going to tell you about the plus first, and then tell you why there's some reason for concern that you may want to keep in mind. So the plus was, for a long period of time, IVF was considered to be practice of medicine, so it's not regulated by the FDA. And so that was pretty straightforward. It's a self-regulation uh, that occurs. And even though we've got millions of babies being born uh, by using IVF procedures, and you store blastocysts, and you process them, and you keep them in culture for three to four days, it's not considered uh, a regulated product, right? It's different. And even donation of eggs is not considered the same way as you can consider donation of tissue because there are certain parental rights that go with the donation of an egg which are not there with any donated tissue that you have. So there's a whole difference in that procedure. So why am I saying then there's an issue with regulation? So there's an issue with regulation because the FDA recently introduced certain new rules on what narrowing the definition of practice of medicine they defined any medical product as a product that had been in culture for more than a certain period of time, which was more than minimally manipulated, and it had been frozen, you know, and it was not being implanted in the same individual. Keep that in mind, not being implanted back in the same individual, right? So an egg is, once it's fertilized, it's not the same individual, right? It all depends on how regulations are interpreted, right? And, and whether the FDA will suddenly now decide that that's going to be part, IVF is going to be regulated. So that kind of governmental creep is something that we always have to be concerned with. And the reason why I raise it as a possibility is simply because of what happened with parthenogenetic lines, right? Parthenogenetic lines should not have been covered by these sorts of regulations and didn't have the same ethical concerns, but they were. And we haven't been able to get that changed. So we have to worry. And again, this sort of creep in terms of regulations and policy, I want to remind people of what happened with cord blood banks. Cord blood banks were not regulated, but now they have to get a license and they are regulated by the FDA because it's considered to be more than minimal manipulation as far as those cells are concerned. Okay. So, so I told you a little bit about policy and why we need to worry about it. There's a little bit about regulations and why you need to worry about it. And you heard a lot about funding and what happens with the ESC registry, so I'm not going to tell you anything more about it. I'm going to now tell you a little bit more about the implications as we move forward because science and technology has moved and why government regulations can still alter the way directions may go. So one important thing is uh, this whole thing that's happened with uh, technological breakthroughs in IVF. And one of them has been what's called PGD, or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, where we can take out a single cell and we can do a genetic diagnosis and then we can make a decision on whether the cells should, uh, the blastocyst should be implanted or not. And there was a next thing about that in terms of mitochondrial disease that you heard about, and that was a technique called ooplasm transfer. So ooplasm transfer was simply taking out cytoplasm from a healthy egg and transplanting it into uh, egg which had a mitochondrial disease. And so you transferred certain mitochondria as well. And now you had a child which had genetic material from three parents, right, in some fashion because your mitochondria carry genetic material. Healthy live births have occurred as far as that is concerned. SCNT is the reverse way of performing genetic transfer. And the question has now going to be, become, is that going to be regulated differently or is this going to be two choices where you will say, rather than transferring cytoplasm, uh, to make transferring nuclei might be better, but will I do one because that's not regulated and will I do, not do the other, even though it's better medically or not, becomes a choice that's not being made by medicine but is being made because of policy. And so that's one very important thing to remember in, in being able to do it. A second important thing has been for science has been this idea of being able to do SCNT, but because eggs are expensive, not doing it in human eggs, but doing it in eggs of other species where the eggs are widely available. And a lot of people have argued that we should be able to do that as long as we're not implanting and not making 
chimeras in vivo, right? We're not making cross-species chimeras, we're just using it to study basic science. But in many countries, that's against the law. So you can't transfer nuclei into a rabbit oocyte because you can get hundreds of them very easily, and that becomes an, a legal issue on whether you can advance science in a particular way or not, and whether that's a reasonable way to go or not. There's actually a third piece that people have done, and which was you wanted to make chimeras, but at a later stage, because you could do something, take advantage of animals as bioreactors, just like we transfer animal organs. What you can do is transfer human cells at an early stage, maybe at a fetal stage, and then they will, uh, and make sure that they're constructed the right way because of engineering, so that they only go to a kidney, so that they make a humanized kidney, just like we make humanized mice for the immune system, etc. And there are a lot of scientific reasons for doing it, and there are also reasons for treatment that we could do in terms of technology. Not that I'm saying that there's a right way or wrong way to do it or whether this is ethical, legal or moral. Those are decisions society has to make. But what I'm telling you is that science is at a stage where all of this is possible. And there are scientists who want to do these experiments because they think they're important or they'll give them answers or a direction or they'll make some new discovery with that that they might be interested in. And that's going to be an important question that uh, we will have to grapple with as we move forward in, in doing this. This is technology, it's here today, we can do this. And uh, should we be doing it, or if not, what should be the guidances under which we do this and not? There's two other important issues that are related to guidelines and policy that I want to uh, emphasize, which are really critical about making ES cells of whichever kind from here. And this is the problem of traceability and how far downstream can you go of, and what's legal in one country and how, how do you sort of control downstream events uh, for something that's now not legal in another country. So the laws for what we can do or not do are very different. Even if we take countries which have the similar legal system such as the UK and the United States, the rules between what we can do in SCA and T are different okay, between the two countries. Now, let's imagine a scenario, just a simple scenario, right? Somebody makes a line uh, using what's legal in the in UK and uh, has ESL lines and they bank them and then they make neuro neural stem cells or neurons from them. And I, you know, it's got a number, I look at it and say, boy, these are great neurons, I want to use them here and I file a form uh, to import those neurons. How do I know, how did that investigator make the cells? How do I know that it would be illegal in the, in the United States? Because there's no way I can test the material when I get it to say that it was made illegally or legally under current US law, or what was there and at what year it was made even, right? Uh, ES line made in 2009 in Germany is legal, made in 2010, it's illegal, right? But how do I trace what I got? Is it okay or not okay? But if I use something that's illegal, then I have done something criminal without being able to guarantee that I've done something legal. And we have no mechanism of traceability. We have no way of knowing for all the downstream events. But the NIH in its wisdom, and the U US government in its wisdom, said not only are the ES cells, uh, which were derived in a way or by policy were not registered on the ES line, all downstream products from that ES line, which is immortal forever, will no longer be eligible for federal funding. And I don't know how that can be implemented, but what it's done is, by making that a law, you've made everybody a potential criminal without realizing that they're going to be criminals. And I think that's, uh, I think, a big problem that we have to worry about. I mean, I'll leave you with these sorts of issues, but these are sort of specific issues which are a little bit different from ethics in terms of government policy and how it can have implications on what can be done. And hopefully you see what I mean by uh, issues related to funding, issues related to regulations, and issues related to policy, and lack of international harmonization of the rules uh, as they're concerned. I'll turn it over to Steve who will tell you a little bit about commercial applications. I'm Stephen Chang from the New York Stem Cell Foundation. I'm the Vice President of Research and Development. I do a lot of the uh, business uh, development activities surrounding uh, technologies. Um, 
this is actually a very short presentation because there is actually no, uh, to my knowledge, uh, commercial uh, activities in this sense. Uh, the commercial activities in the sense of the technology has always been through the in vitro fertilization clinics, the IVF clinics, where the field itself is about supplying uh, individuals with reproductive, uh, uh, you know, uh, techno technologies to essentially have children. And the industry is built around that uh, industry in which is regulated. It's not really regulated. It's regulated about who donates primarily. And the regulations are about the materials, et cetera, et cetera, that is necessary for the whole process is not very highly regulated. So e IVF itself, and there's about five, maybe six million people now born in the world, and it's actually a very, very common technique, in, especially in Asia and China, where, where we, uh, the whole population of aging, where uh, women deciding to have children later in life, the uh, technology of IVF is there. So the real issue then is um, looking at how somatic cell nuclear transfer is. And so one of the things I did was I did the thing called Google Search. And Google Search says how many patents have been filed in this area. And there have been a lot of patents filed, including work that some of the work that Dieter has done, said that this technique of doing what we've done, uh, he's done with uh, in usual for and Shukra Miltalopov. The question is how do you um, commercialize that? And then we had, I think uh, Adam put up there probably the one area, I think the area of therapeutic cloning, which is making uh, cells, essentially identical cells, embryonic cells from individuals. That is uh, an area where cell therapy, that's the whole concept of cell therapy, uh, and the necessity for cell therapy, it's still an open uh, uh, question because nobody's really shown total efficacy having this type of uh, technique. So the in, in many of here, I don't need to tell you as you walked around here in the various talks, the discussions about what is going to be a th the next therapeutic success with this. It's an open area. Now, if the technique is shown that um, mesenchymal uh, stromal cells uh, are not useful and that the iPS cells are useful or embryonic cells are useful in clinical scenarios, then there'll be this huge gold rush to start generating these cell types. But at right now, at this time, um, you don't see that. There is a lot of uh, uh, hope, a lot of data saying that clearly many of the cell therapies that used, uh, be it autologous or allergenic, are very, very safe. But the, in terms of the real uh, uh, bang for the buck is real true efficacy in showing that. And I think there are two trials that will show that, and those are the, uh, the a trial that has just begun in uh, Japan using iPS cells, and a trial that's being carefully done uh, and in uh, England by um, uh, the Pfizer group with the London project and the eye showing the uh, use of RPEs and showing this type of real, real specific uh, uh, efficacy. And it's a real targeted efficacy. There are a lot of other experiments I don't need to go into. But I think the real issue, the real uh, area where this area may be very, is, is the idea of infertility. And uh, the data from infertility says as the as the eight, as women get older, the eggs are less and less capable of uh, uh, essentially becoming uh, fertilized. And so it's clearly an issue with uh, mitochondrial uh, issues. And then the idea is to uh, essentially use somatic cell nuclear transfer. And there may be an issue where commercialization will be through the IVF clinics. And that's where the whole area of where we're going to go from there and how is going to, who's going to do it, who's going to regulate it is really, really open. So I think that's really this. I think we should open up for questions because it's uh, getting pretty late. Thanks. Call everybody on the stage. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. It's a very interesting topic. Um, I have two questions. Um, one has to do with the provenance of the human material involved in SCNT that's nobody that nobody's talked about yet, and that's the fibroblast. Um, I'm interested in how you have reviewed the provenance of that material. The, so you um, mean the fibroblast that are used for the derivation? Okay. For, if, for the somatic cell nuclear transfer. Um, I believe in the, all the published cases that there were SCNT 
done with um, fibroblasts from repositories as well as fibroblasts from donors. Um, and so the question about what kind of review was under the informed consent for, for that material and whether or not there was compensation provided. And then my second question um, is, is whether or not you're looking at ways of using frozen oocytes to try to um, uh, tap what is a, uh, must be a, a large collection of frozen oocytes, the same way that um, embryonic stem cell research was using frozen IVF embryos in part because so many of them were available. Thanks. Did you? I think these are very uh, good and detailed questions and I'll try to answer them to the best of my knowledge. So what we, we have at the, in New York, um, in cooperation with the Normal Berry Diabetes Center, we have an approved IRB for the donation of skin cells to make stem cells by nuclear transfer. And so these people donating the skin cells provide informed consent for using those cells. And I showed you this morning the derivation of these type 1 diabetic stem cell lines were exactly obtained this way. So these people know what's being done with their cells. And it, I think what I wanted to mention, I wanted to share a story with you which kind of relates to what Aaron said earlier. When we started to do that research, uh, Columbia University, like many other institutions, of course, depend heavily on NIH dollars, and was very hesitant to even have the skin cell lines derived in their facility for nuclear transfer. Even though nuclear transfer was not being done at Columbia University, they did not want them to be derived in that facility because of of NIH dollars. And I think this is one of the main reasons why Susan Solomon of the New York Stem Cell Foundation stepped forward and said we need to create a private lab that doesn't have any NIH dollars in there. You can see what a tremendous effect regulations and guidelines have on how science is being done. I remember when I was at Harvard University that Douglas Melton had to use separate equipment for you know, using human embryonic stem cells versus mouse stem cells. Here, the New York Stem Cell Foundation had to go as far as establishing an entire lab for being able to do the somatic cell nuclear transfer research. So we had to go incredibly far, both in terms of ethical standards and funding ways to, to, to make this possible. And it's remarkable it happened in the first place. And what about the frozen oocytes? Yes, I'm going to get to that. I'm sorry I'm taking so long. But um, frozen oocytes in general don't have the exact same developmental competence as um, fresh oocytes. So even today, it's preferable to use fresh oocytes for reproductive purposes than frozen oocytes. And, it, and nuclear transfer, of course, decreases developmental potential, and so the preferred way is to use fresh oocytes, the highest quality oocytes one can get. Can I comment on I just want to comment on the frozen oocyte issue as well. I mean, it turns out that the freezing and thawing of oocytes is actually a relatively new technology, while freezing and thawing of embryos is, is quite old. So while there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of frozen embryos now around the United States, there's a much actually smaller number of, of frozen oocytes and it'll be interesting to see over the coming years. It is now actually quite common to freeze oocytes and to use them for reproductive purposes. It's rapidly becoming the norm in IVF. Um, and it's, so the new techniques might allow the use of frozen oocytes for somatic cell nuclear transfer in a way that earlier freezing approaches did not. So that might be an emerging issue in the, in the future. So actually, 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 it's an interesting thing. We're the only organization left uh, that accepts uh, frozen embryos. Uh, they discard, I mean, we have been in contact with all the uh, major IVF clinics. Uh, most people have been just been throwing them away. And originally Stanford and uh, I think the University of Chicago, one of the groups in Chicago, were accepting uh, uh, embryos for leftover for derivation and we're the only group left that we, we get, you know, uh, consented embryos for, again, for having a large bank of embryonic stem cells. Uh, our intention is to, it's to build a huge embryonic stem cell bank in addition to our IPS cell banking that we've been doing. So, did you, I mean, I had a question for you in terms of efficiency, so on a scientific level, 
Is there any advantage to using like an IPSC line or an ESC line nucleus in doing somatic cell nuclear transfer rather than using a fibroblast nucleus? Uh, does that change anything? We haven't done that experiment extensively. I mean, both of them seem to develop to the blastocyst stage. Overall, nuclear transfer is still quite inefficient. So you need a one to two oocyte donation to get a stem cell line. I think that, that efficiency might go up as, as we further improve the protocol, but it's a possibility that this, this could lead to some improvement. Any other questions? Rosario, I know I interrupted you when you were going to ask your first question. That's okay. I forgot my question. I will just make a, a comment. Um, what is interesting that when this presentation was you, very US-centric, how the concerns and issues you have raised parallel internationally. We have been following over 25 countries in an international comparative study and how these countries regulate stem cell research, whether it's embryonic and iPSCs. Um, how compensation models for egg donation for SCNT and others. And they all have a plethora of approaches. But if we look at the last uh, 10 years, nothing has moved policy-wise in that regard. However, the, um, and remember, out of the 20 countries that we monitor, although we have one study made eight years ago, we follow 50 countries. And 10 of them, including the US, just because it's statewide, allowed SCNT or the creation of embryos for research purposes. And none of these countries, and the countries that do not allow SCNT or research cloning, have adopted legislation that clearly closes the gap from which you can create gametes or embryo-like bodies using other methods. And that's really interesting. They have not changed also. For those countries, they have a definition what the human embryo is have adapted the legislation as well. So I will be um, provocative and will say that maybe to SCNT you will have some problems uh, to create SCNT embryos and sharing internationally because of the regulations, but if you can create with other methods, other sort of gametes and embryos, you might get away with it because there, there's a regulatory loophole. So thank you. So Aaron, in your presentation, you had made a point that there is a path, even though it's difficult for commercialization. So could you walk us through a possible path? And maybe, Steve, you can comment on that path? Well, I may have, I may have promised too much there, Mahendra. Um, my uh, sort of inspiration for thinking that was actually looking at some of the, the challenges of commercialization in, in other areas of cell therapy and looking at fairly innovative approaches to, to try to, to make it work. Um, and so the, the caveat would be, and I'm kind of speaking from a, a pa panel where I heard a bunch of health economists speaking about the future of cell therapy a couple of weeks ago, and you need a cell therapy where the, the, the improvement delta is sufficiently large that you can justify the massive expenditures in terms of dealing with the regulatory environment and, you know, and that sort of thing. Um, if that was the case, you know, maybe you could, some, some pharma could figure out the way to work work with FDA and get something through. I suspect, actually, though, that somatic cell nuclear transfer is not going to be commercializable until there's a, a better approach to acquiring human eggs. Um, and for mitochondrial disease. Maybe for mitochondrial in, in limited circumstances. I, mean, I wouldn't be surprised if the UK moved that forward through the, at some point in the next, or similar approaches. Um, and the US might follow if it, was, if it was promising in the UK. So I think there is maybe a, a route there, and really there it's about divorcing the idea of mitochondrial transfer and cytoplasm transfer from somatic cell nuclear transfer. Although the techniques are very similar, you don't really want FDA thinking about this as being very close to, to cloning. And as we know, the history of IVF in the United States, again being US-centric, is not of FDA oversight except in these couple of cases. So there's the back in, in New Jersey and now a decade or so ago, some people were using a, a similar technique to this idea, but without going through FDA. From all the anecdotal cases, it seems to have worked reasonably well. There's pictures of kids out there that were created through these techniques, but no systematic follow-up. FDA shut it down by putting and sending out some warning letters. Um, and that and really the attempt by the Ray Elians and a few others to use um, human somatic cell nuclear transfer for cloning is really the only other time the FDA has gotten involved in reproduction. Um, and so to the extent that they're willing to minimize 
their involvement. Um, there might be a path forward. It helps that IVF doesn't deal with you know, the reimbursement issues. This is all private pay in the United States and almost certainly would be in this case, and, and that could work. I think the cell therapy model, you know, maybe look if, if the immunotherapies are successful and the, the big pharma manages to, to figure out how to, to make those personalized autologous therapies work, you know, and somebody, Dieter or others, figures out how to really deal with a, a disease where there's significant sort of market headroom, maybe you can get that through. But I think that's, that's long term, and maybe the best hope is figuring out another approach to producing human eggs. So maybe if eggs were produced through stem cell, through IPS cells, you know, suddenly you don't have the, the issues of egg acquisition from, from female donors, and that might change the calculus, although that raises a whole other set of issues we probably don't have time to, to go into. So Steve, you know, NICEF has funded this whole effort, right, and has said that this is so that it'd be widely available. So is there a... Yeah, I mean, it, it will, I mean the idea is to make, we, we, and I think Dieter put it best, while his data, uh, while Shukrat Miltalopov had a paper showing that he saw differences in embryonic stem cells, nuclear NT cells, nuclear transfer cells, versus those of IPS cells, Dieter's work uh, recently published showed there was no difference. I think the jury's out in that. Are, are, there, are these cells superior or better? And the answer is, I think Dieter put it so uh, well, is that they, we don't know. And that's a good answer, and we should continue working on that. Um, in terms of commercialization, I think I always tell people when I teach at business school, I have the P's, because you know, I've started, I think, seven companies, and fairly successfully. And the P's are really easy. P's are, what's the, in this product? Is there a patentable uh, thing? It's clearly patentable. This has been patented. Now, the question is, it may be reversed, but there are clearly issued U.S. patents. Uh, as well as European patents, oh no, in a, uh, foreign patents. Europe, it can't be patented in some of these things. But it clearly is patents. So the question is, what's the product? What are the product from these patents that will be useful? And that's really the big question. I think Aaron put it well. Is it a cell therapy? Is it this? Uh, a technique patent is really difficult to monitor because these in vitro fertilization clinics are essentially private. Nobody's watching them do the work. It's a, uh, a technician or a physician uh, manipulating the egg and too quickly doing this. And so that really becomes what's the product. Clearly, from a commercialization standpoint, there are patents. Uh, Shukrat, the Oregon uh, Health Sciences, has, has continues to file on the, his work, and so we also the Stem Cell Foundation. But in terms of actual commercial path to success, it's not clear. And it's clearly more of a support for the field that we continue to work on that, because we feel that uh, while IPS cells are um, really important, uh, I remind people, and I, a good friend of mine says, remember, those two of those genes are oncogenes, and those oncogenes are used to essentially reverse this. And another thing that's really important to point out, and I think Dieter will, says that, when you put a somatic cell nucleus into a nuclear transfer, it automatically reprograms. It's so quick. IPS cell derivation is totally different. It takes days, weeks for these things to happen. So the conversion process is totally different. And why it works so well in an egg, and I think Dieter put it well, is that's what it's set up to do. And a somatic cell is not. So we, I think that if you keep in that, about the biology in mind, that uh, there is tremendous differences. And so I think we at the foundation, since we can work on it, we continue to push it, and we encourage those who can because we certainly like uh, more so people. If you build it, it'll come. Right. I, I know we are almost out of time, but what I wanted to do was ask you guys, each one of you, to give me one last thought on if there was a single thing you wanted to change, right? And I know we have to say it for the U.S. since you work in the U.S., what would you change? And what would be the real game change, right, in your mind? So maybe it's a scientific breakthrough, maybe, as Aaron pointed out, maybe it's a regulatory change, maybe it's, well, some company needs to step up to the plate. I don't care what, whatever, but just quick one sentence each, right? In what funding. Are, funding, okay. I think there's too much regulation that tries to contain research. One is afraid to do certain things, one is afraid to work with human, with human eggs. The regulation should be at the, at the point of what transpires into medical treatments. Not, one shouldn't be afraid to do the research. Okay. 
I think for SCNT, I think it's funding and eggs. Okay, so funding and eggs, okay. which are related. So on that note, thank you everybody for taking the time. Hope you found this useful.